theories of thought or they show in history. Welcome. Thanks so much. I, I didn't mention it's not uh, uh, just in case anybody didn't know. Press is one of our new uh, Rutgers postdocs. He joined us uh, uh, in the fall, and uh, we're very happy to have him here. Great. So just take it away, Press. All right. Great. Yes, I'm uh, thrilled to be here at Rutgers, working here, and uh, happy to talk to you about some of my work today. All right. Um, so, before I get into the substance of this talk, just a, a bit of an overview of uh, what my dissertation was about. Um, it's about the relationship between two marks of the mental. So, um, mental states have intentionality, that is, they are about states of the world. Uh, they are directed towards some state of affairs. They have content. Um, and then at least some mental states have phenomenal character. That is, for some mental states, there's something it's like for the subject to be in them. And then given these two marks of the mental, we can ask a question. What's the relationship between these two marks of the mental? Is there anything uh, particularly interesting or important about these two, these two properties? Um, and if so, what, what is it? Um, now, the, the label representationalism uh, gets used in a variety of ways, but in this context, it posits a very close relationship between intentional properties and phenomenal properties. Um, now, for the representationalist, to be a phenomenal property just is to be a representation. Some people fiddle with the, the just is. You might want a different metaphysical relation in there other than identity. Um, but uh, to be a phenomenal property, to be a uh, what it's like property, just is to be a kind of way of representing the world for the representation. Um, maybe there's not an, or, an orthodox view um, when it comes to consciousness. Everything's up for grabs, maybe. Um, but it's a it's a Pop, it's a fairly popular view, representationalism. Um, and, and that's the case when it comes to perceptual or sensory mental states. That is, mental states having to do with our senses, audition, vision, uh, our tactile mental states, olfactory states. Um, but interestingly, when it comes to cognitive mental states, states like beliefs, thoughts, and judgments, wanderings, and so on, uh, this is not the orthodox answer. Um, and in fact, many representationalists, for example, Michael Tai, uh, don't think there is any interesting relationship between a cognitive state's intentional properties and its associated phenomenal character, simply because there is no phenomenal character proprietary to cognitive states. Um, so we had this kind of uh, lack of parity between uh, representationalism about the sensory domain, and then we're not going to tell a sort of analogous represent, representationalist story about the cognitive domain. Um, and and my, my dissertation and my, my work generally so far has been trying to remedy this, trying to establish that these two views, uh, what I call cognitive representationalism and perceptual representationalism, stand or fall together. OK. Um, and that involves the uh, elaboration uh, and defense of two different particular theses. So first thesis is the existence thesis. Um, the existence thesis says thoughts have non-sensory phenomenal character. That is, a kind of phenomenal character lacked by sensory perception, broadly construed to include things like bodily sensation and inner speech. Okay, and I uh, explore this in a, a recent paper. Um, I argue for the existence thesis in a, by appealing to this phenomenon of aphantasia, people who report uh, not thinking with mental imagery. The second thesis is the determination thesis. And that says for any cognitive, that should be phenomenal, cognitive phenomenal property P, there exists some content C such that if subject S has P, then S thinks the content C. So we have these non-sensory phenomenal characters. There's something it's like to have, to be in, a, in certain cognitive states. Um, 
And these phenomenal properties play a content determining role. Okay. And so that's the, that's the sort of whatever metaphor, 3,000 foot view, is that? Yeah. Um, now zooming in, uh, this talk I'm playing defense. I want to defend the view against uh, an objection that I'm sort of cooking up. Uh, it's inspired by conversations with uh, Richard Samuels, uh, Rutgers PhD, philosophy PhD graduate um, and member of my dissertation committee at, OSC, at the Ohio State University. Um, and so I'm going to defend the talk, sorry, the phenomenal view of thought against an objection. And the objection is that the phenomenal view is chauvinistic in a particular sense. That is, it withholds thoughts from creatures or systems that, in fact, have them. OK. So that's the goal. Here's the plan. First, I'll introduce the phenomenal theory of thought, say a bit, about, a, a bit more about what it is, what it isn't committed to. Then I'll explain what it is for a theory of mind to be chauvinistic. OK. And then I'll develop three different chauvinism challenges to the phenomenal theory, give responses to them, try and think about what someone who likes this view ought to say to these challenges. OK. And uh, this is still a uh, work in progress, so I look forward to you guys helping me out uh, with how to think through these issues. OK. So first, first order of business, the phenomenal theory of thought. Uh, the phenomenal theory of thought is an answer to a question, what determines the, the contents of our thoughts? Okay. Proponents of the phenomenal view say, it's just what it's like for the subject to have the thought. That is, it's phenomenal character. Proponents of the view include Terry Horgan, David Pitt, Charles Seward, and Galen Strawson, younger Strawson. Um, so on this view, thoughts are occurrences in the stream of consciousness. OK? And as I said in the, inter in, in, at the 3,000 foot view, uh, the kind of phenomenal character had by thoughts is not, uh, well, uh, I said phenomenology is simplicity, but it's not, it's not sensory phenomenology. It's cognitive phenomenology, OK? It's not the goal of this talk to argue for the existence uh, of cognitive phenomenology, um, the existence thesis, but a way of seeing it uh, would be to hold all the sensory phenomenal properties of a, of a state the same uh, and yet have a change, I guess show there's a change in the phenomenal character uh, of the state. And then what, ex what explains that change then uh, it's thought is cognitive phenomenology. And so the, the way this gets done is often with uh, ambiguous phrases like this. So, Take the phrase Assad's killers. You might first hear this uh, about Assad's henchmen at, a, at, a, at one time. And then later, at a second time, you hear it uh, about uh, Assad's assassins. Right? The idea is that there's a, a felt difference in what it's like uh, to understand the, the, this phrase um, as meaning two different things. And the difference in phenomenal character is due to the difference in meaning. OK, a few clarifications. First, uh, the kind of content that is phenomenally determined is uh, intended to be narrow content, is determined inside the head. Many people think phenomenal character is narrow, and so the content that's determined by phenomenal character will also be narrow. Um, but I, I tend this to be compatible with so-called wide content. Um, if you're worried about uh, twin Earth cases or thought, Bergian thought experiments, um, uh, I intend for this view to be compatible with, with wide content. And it's a view about, about content. Right? So if intentionality is a matter of uh, taking an intentional attitude towards an intentional content. Um, uh, I don't intend to tell a sort of a phenomenal, phenomenally inspired story about attitudes, though some in this literature do that. Okay. 
clarifications given, we can state the view. Okay. So it's going to come in two, two stages. Necessarily for any thought with the content that P, there exists some cognitive phenomenal property that the subject thinking the thought instantiates. And necessarily for any cognitive phenomenal property the subject instantiates, there's some content P the subject thinks. Okay. So the phenomenal view of thought places a necessary condition of phenomenal character on thought possession. And you might think, why, <laughs> why does a, uh, why, why should phenomenal character have such a, uh, a point of pride, a place of pride, um, in theorizing about thought? Uh, this view you might think is chauvinistic, and we owe this lovely label to Ned Block. Chauvinism is kind of. I was explaining this to a friend earlier, and it's like that's kind of an intense word. I was like, yeah, we we have Ned Block to, to thank here. Um, Okay, so a theory of mind is chauvinistic when it denies mental states of systems that, in fact, have them. Okay, so take, for example, the mind-brain identity theory. First, well, I guess promulgated in the 50s. Um, the mind-brain identity theory is chauvinistic because there might have been Martians um, who don't have the same physical realization. Uh, as our mental states do, and so pain might have a different, uh, because pain might have a different physical realization, identity theory can't be right. Okay, so it's chauvinistic in denying the fact that Martians might have pain. Okay. You might then retreat to a kind of functionalism um, and say, hey, maybe pain is the kind of thing that can be multiply realized in different physical states. Okay. But common sense functionalism also faces a, a chauvinism objection. Right? Mental states are individuated, uh, on common sense functionalism, mental states are individuated by their functional roles as specified by terms that everyone understands, that is, by, by folk psychology. But we can also conceive of madmen, of madmen, whose pain can come apart from their functional role, right? So uh, L David Lewis has this example of, uh, we can imagine, we can co coherently conceive of someone who feels pain and yet the pain doesn't cause them to wince or yell out. And it's not caused by tissue damage. Um, I forget what exactly uh, Lewis's madman, the functional profile, uh, his pain has, I think it's like thinking about mathematics or something. Um, but we can, we can, we can, yeah. <laughs> We can, uh, we, we can conceive of pain coming apart from uh, the functional profile that it typically plays in us. Okay. And so Lewis really says, you know, if I want a credible theory of mind, I, I need a theory that doesn't deny the possibility of mad pain. Okay. Now a bit more about chauvinism. So why is it that we can conceive of Lewisian madmen and Martians. Well, it's because we have a, a first personal concept of mind, right? We can imagine being in pain and yet being organized different, both functionally and physically, right? We can thus imagine these phenomenal properties coming apart from their physical realizers and functional roles. Okay, that is sometimes it's, but we have a phenomenal concept of mind. Okay, and so you might think, hey, the phenomenal theory might appear well positioned to avoid charges of chauvinism because it's putting a, a, a barrier to entry on thought possession uh, with phenomenal character. So you think, all right, maybe this is going to get the right answers. Um, but the goal of this talk is to develop three different objections, chauvinism objections to the phenomenal view and respond to each. Okay. So the first chauvinism objection. The first one's from introspection. Um, just a wall of text here. I, I'm gonna read this, I'm sorry. Uh, but I think it's, I think it's useful uh, 
to, to think through. Uh, this is Robert Wilson. Robert Wilson is not a fan of the phenomenal view of thought, uh, and you'll see why. So, I'm going to read this. Wilson writes, in the spirit of Horgan and Teenson's appeal for a reader to pay attention to your own experience. Horgan and Teenson, they're on my team. They like the theory, the phenomenal view. They think that it's just manifest. You just introspect, pay attention to your own experience. You'll notice that uh, thoughts are playing a content determining role in your, in your experience. Uh, uh, or some phenomenal characters playing a content determining role in your experience. Uh, so Wilson writes, I've done this. I've just did the decisive experiment. First I had the thought George Bush is president of the United States. And I had some CNN mediated auditory and visual phenomenology. Okay, this is written in 2003, so for the, for the example. Uh, it focused on one of his speeches. I took a short break, doodled a bit, wandered around the room, and then had that same thought with the very same content. And Wilson reports nothing. Or at least nothing distinctly Bush-like. I first, I just drew a blank. Realized my coffee was finished, moved on. He says, to be honest, I'm not really sure whether the drawing a blank or the phenomenal feel of realizing my coffee was finished was the phenomenology that accompanied the thought that Bush is president of the United States, or whether I was mistaken in some, in some more basic way about what my phenomenology was, or about what thought I was entertaining. Okay. So this is going to be the basis of the first challenge, the first chauvinism objection to the phenomenal view. Okay. So I've just put it in argument form here. Premise one, one can have the same thought, that P, without having any shared phenomenal character between the two instances. Sorry, yeah. one can have the same thought twice, I should say. And yet, Wilson seems to report there's no shared phenomenal character here uh, between these two instances, these two tokenings of the thought. And if that's right, well then one can have a thought without any content-specific phenomenal character. That is, without a cognitive phenomenal property. And then it's just a modus ponens. Therefore, one can have a thought without any content-specific phenomenal character. That is, without any cognitive phenomenal property. OK. So in response, all the action, I think, is on one. So I'm going to push back against the first premise there, namely that one can have the same thought at P without having any shared phenomenal character between them. OK. Basically, what I think is going on is Wilson's just looking in the wrong place. Right? I think he's looking for things like Bush uh, sensory phenomenology and Bush auditory phenomenology. Right? He's looking for Bush's voice, for Bush's maybe a rough mental picture, a visual mental picture of him. Um, when he should be looking for cognitive phenomenal properties. Something underlying the content that Bush is present. Okay. And so, you know, familiar point in introspection with perception too. What we find is often a, a matter of what we're looking for. Okay. And yeah, this, this is the, the point I just made. At, at a certain time, one's thought that Bush is present might be accompanied with auditory and visual imagery as of Bush, and later it might not be. So there's going to be a drastic phenomenal difference between these two instances of thought. Um, but that's consistent with there being a, co a common f f uh, phenomenal character that Wilson's overlooking. Right. Um, another way you could explain this, and I've, I've done this in earlier work, is with the notion of phenomenal determinals, determinables and determinants. So consider experiencing visual red versus experiencing uh, visual scarlet or crimson, or maybe experiencing scarlet or crimson. Uh, these are both different ways of uh, instantiating the phenomenal determinable red, uh, but they have different determinants. There's different ways of uh, determining the phenomenal determinable phenomenal red. Um, analogously, that might also be what's going on when we have the phenomenal determinable Bush is present. Okay. The idea is, just like we can experience red in a more determinate way, um, and yet there's going to be a, a still, still a commonality between those 
uh, different ways of experiencing red. So too, uh, we might instantiate uh, cognitive phenomenal terminal, co cognitive phenomenal terminals like Bush's president in different ways. Okay. Let's see. Here's just the, the basic point: differences, differences in phenomenal character when having the same thought are compatible with some phenomenal overlap. And it's a mistake, even though it's an understandable one, to ignore the similarities when the differences are so drastic. Okay. And then, kind of a, a dialectical point. Um, Wilson like noticed that he had these two thoughts uh, about Bush, and I guess I would just want to ask like, well, how did you know that you were having those two those two thoughts? Like, was there really nothing it was like to have the thought? Um, uh, uh, you know, how did you know that? You know, could you really know that without could have had that sort of direct introspective knowledge, um, without there being some phenomenal character that's content specific? Um, some people push back on this. Um, Steve Nitsch and Sean Nichols suggest you might just need like a internal monitoring mechanism that it can explain the introspective knowledge that we have. That's so long as that's reliable, that's that's enough to uh, to guarantee sort of uh, introspective knowledge or int introspective justification about how we know we're having the thought. But uh, you can push back against that. Uh, I think it's more natural to say there's something it's like uh, to have the thought. That's how you can, that explains how you know you're having the thought. Uh, Okay, so that's the first chauvinism objection. Done and dusted. Okay. On to the second one. The second chauvinism objection. This one's from thought experiments. Um, maybe a transition bullet here. So if you had Wilson's view that there wasn't any content-specific phenomenal character of thought, you might be motivated to have a, a kind of functionalist like kind of thought. We need some other story to tell. You might appeal to thought's functional properties. What it tends to be caused by and tends to cause itself. Uh, and so this, this raises a different kind of chauvinism objection. Uh, why doesn't a subject with all the functional properties that my thought that P typically has count as having the thought that P? That is, why doesn't a thought's functional properties suffice for me having the thought that P, or the subject having the thought that P, right? If it, look, if it acts like the thought that P, if it, there's, a, there's, a, there's a duck motto uh, slogan somewhere in there. Um, and so what is a thought's functional property? Well, for just an example, my thought that it's raining outside might typically be caused by visually perceiving rain or snowing. Um, it might typically cause me to grab an umbrella or jacket. And the thought is, if I have that thought playing that kind of functional role, then that counts to have the thought. Um, why isn't that enough? Um, okay. <laughs> uh, we can we can push this point further by considering uh, limit cases. So consider a phenomenal zombie, a functional duplicate for whom there's nothing it's like. All is dark inside. Um, yeah, this is a creature has no phenomenal character, but it's functionally, functionally just like us. Um, similarly, you might consider the phenomenal invert, someone whose cognitive phenomenal properties or phenomenal properties in general are swapped with the functional roles they typically play. So remember the Mad Men uh, from Lewis. Maybe uh, he has a phenomenal character of pleasure when he experiences tissue damage. And it's the phenomenal character of pleasure that tends to have him cry out. Uh, OK, so here's the, here's the objection. The idea is phenomenal zombies and phenomenal inverts, they have the sufficient functional role of having a thought. And hey, the phenomenal view of thought rules these cases out. right? And so therefore, your, your view is chauvinistic. Um, I don't know if anyone's watching The Last of Us, but that's a, meant to be a zombie on the, on the bottom there. OK. So again, all the action on one. Uh, yeah, so basically, it's going to be a similar, similar strategy to what I want to say about the, about the, the Mad Men case. Uh, 
Lewis's mad pain case is when the madman feels pain, but the pain has a different functional profile. Okay. In that case, the th it seems to me the thing to say is that the madman is feeling pain. It's just the, the pain is playing a wacky role, right? Um, he just acts as if he doesn't feel pain, right? And if that's right, then it's the phenomenal character that's individuating the pain, not the functional role. Okay. And we can imagine instances of mad thought. Cases of conscious thoughts that come apart from their typical functional role. Right? So a madman might consciously judge the P, even though that conscious thought might dispose of the act as if not P. Right? This is just the inversion case. And I think, yeah, what, what I would want to say to these cases, about these cases, is that uh, the phenomenal invert thinks that P, but from the outside, this thought is just playing in the centric function of the right? And then the zombie doesn't have a thought, but he merely acts as if he's having a thought. Um, appearances can be deceiving. Yeah. OK. Why might, you, why might you like the first premise that uh, wants to let in zombies and inverts into the, the realm of thinkers? Um, what's motivating one? Uh, well, some people might sort of be at a loss. You might think there's no other way to determine the content of our thought but for appealing to what it tends to cause and be caused by. But the phenomenal view just uh, is meant to be an alternative, right? So if you, if you think that, then you, uh, you're just assuming the falsity of the phenomenal view. Right? Just begging the question to get to. Um, you might also want to reduce intentional content. Maybe that's what's motivating one um, for maybe naturalistic reasons. Um, and in response to that, I just, no reason why appealing to consciousness can't be part of a naturalistic explanation, even if doing so makes reduction harder to come by. Um, yeah, OK. So that's kind of, I meant to kind of undercut some of the skepticism that, uh, that uh, is present, I think, uh, or directed towards the phenomenal view. OK. Second chauvinism objection check. <laughs> All right, last one. The chauvinism objection from unconscious thought. So, familiar phenomenon. People often report uh, arriving at a question, an answer to a question or a, a solution to a problem by sleeping on it. Or maybe you're working on something and then you like, I don't know, go for a walk and don't think about it for a while and aha, the answer comes from on high. It just pops into your head. Um, the idea is not consciously thinking about something uh, what can often assist you in coming to a solution. Okay. And interestingly, there's been studies showing this to be a robust phenomenon. Um, it's most associated with this guy at the Dixter House uh, in what he calls the unconscious thought paradigm in psychology. Okay, I'm gonna draw on these cases to develop the, the third chauvinism objection. Okay, so what's going on in, in these experiments? Uh, they, the, the researchers asked some subjects to make a decision after a period of consciously deliberating about some, some problem, some decision they are uh, given. Okay. Um, that's one group. And then a second group is asked to make a decision after a period of distraction, after like doing some puzzle or an anagram test. Um, and interestingly, the subjects who made their decision after a distraction period tended to make better decisions on the prompt than the subjects engaging in conscious deliberation. So people who engage in the distraction task tended to make better decisions, I guess, by their own lights than those who consciously deliberate. That's interesting. What explains this? Well, Dixter House and colleagues argue that the best explanation to this is that 
the distracted subjects are having some unconscious thinking going on below the surface of consciousness uh, about the decision being made while they're consciously attending to some, some other task. OK. And so maybe walking through an example would be good. Uh, so yeah, this is maybe, maybe this is overkill. But first subjects are presented with a decision problem. They're asked, imagine you're looking for a new roommate. And then they're given information about various roommates. All right. Then different uh, groups at the goal induction stage are given, given two different directions. One group, hey, sit down and consciously think about what is the best roommate. Who's, who are you going to choose? Um, a second group is told that, hey, soon you'll be asked to choose a candidate, but uh, you should do this anagram task for a few minutes. OK. And then finally, after a few minutes, both groups are asked, hey, choose a roommate. And interestingly, the, the distraction group performs better. That's what's, what's fascinating about this. Uh, OK. So this looks like the basis of an, obje an objection. Right, it's what explains this unconscious thinking. OK. So hey, these guys are having unconscious thoughts. That's what explains their decisions when they choose uh, roommates or make other decisions in these studies. And the phenomenal theory of thought says that they don't exist. And so you're, the phenomenal theory of thought Extensively inadequate. <laughs> Getting the wrong result. OK. So again, against the first premise. Um, first, it's notable that the, the psychologists engaged in the UT paradigm uh, define thinking as a process rather than as a, a punctate state. Um, and so you might think, hey, there's, there's different phenomena here. One's a process and one's a state, right? And so on, on the phenomenal view of thought, thoughts are just cognitive phenomenal properties instantiated by the subject at a determinate time. Whereas what you guys are describing, Dixter House and colleagues, uh, you guys define unconscious thinking as a process of deliberation that ha just happens unconsciously. And so maybe there's maybe there's no tension here. You might think maybe there's there's no real threat to the flow. Um, but then I can imagine them coming back and saying, "Well, surely there are states on which thinking as a process is operating over, right? Are these states uh, that the process operates over? Are those not unconscious thoughts?" Um, and. I'm not exactly sure what I want to say, how I want to put my response, um, but I think what I want to say on behalf of the proponent of the phenomenal view um, is that these are intentional states, but they're not yet thoughts. Okay, they have their content in virtue of their connections with conscious states. With conscious states. Okay. So compare belief. Beliefs are usually taken to be standing states. Right, so it makes sense to credit me with the belief that uh, Ankara is the capital of Turkey, even if I'm not sort of consciously tokening that, that thought uh, in consciousness. Um, that's because belief is a dispositional state. Right? It's something that's stored somehow um, uh, and gets activated, if you like, uh, in consciousness at relevant times. Um, and yet, there can be unconscious changes to one's beliefs. And so we already have this kind of machinery, I think, that I like um, to rebut this kind of challenge from the, from the UT paradigm. Um, but arguably, uh, the content of a belief is acquired by its connection to conscious judgment. So this is a, a view on which belief states get their content, inherit their content from uh, their connection to conscious judgments. That is, the belief is just a disposition to, to consciously judge. Um, uh, and basically, I, I think I just want to tell a similar story about the unconscious intentional states posited by the UT paradigm. Right? There can be inference-like 
changes that happen to these states below the surface of consciousness. Um, but their content is determined via their connections to conscious judgments. What's happening in the uh, in the in, in the studies? Well, it's it's just uh, I, I get some state, and that state has its content just to, uh, in virtue of its uh, its. I'm, I'm disposed to judge that uh, this roommate's better, and that's an occurrence in consciousness, and that's uh, what supplies the unconscious state with content. Okay, so done and dusted. Three objections, three chauvinism, chauvinism objections promoted. All right. So just wrapping up, the proponent of the phenomenal view can resist the chauvinism objection from introspection doesn't follow from the fact that one does not detect cognitive phenomenology introspectively, that some phenomenology is present. They can also rebut the objection from thought experiments in cases where a state's phenomenal properties and functional properties diverge. Um, the former, uh, uh, the, the right thing to say seems to be the former determined thought attribution rather than the latter. It's a typo. And finally, we can resist the chauvinism objection from unconscious thought. Unconscious thoughts aren't thoughts. So I'm being a bit stipulated here. They're not thoughts, but they're intentional states with content derived from conscious states, on which unconscious changes can occur. OK. Final conclusions. One way of appreciating the phenomenal view is that it says thoughts are like pains. That is, they have phenomenal character in virtue of their content. We can miss them in introspection. Their functional properties don't suffice for being in them. If there are unconscious states that share their content, they do so derivatively. And those who wish to say otherwise face the burden of saying why pain and thought should be treated differently. Okay, that's it. This is my co-author, by the way. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Uh, we'll take more questions. Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, yeah, I just want to get uh, a place where I can type because <laughs> I know I want to take notes. Okay. Uh, Andrew, yeah. Thanks. So I'm pretty sympathetic to, um, so I'm pretty sympathetic to most of your uh, replies. Uh, yeah. I just had uh, one worry yeah. about your response to uh, the second. Uh, Objection. Oh yeah. Okay. Communistic objection, where you mention uh, why we might want to um, have a uh, non-phenomenal theory of thought. One thing you said, well, maybe we want to be naturalists, so when we oh yeah reduce thought uh, at the fundamental level, we don't want things like uh, phenomenology coming up. So I was thinking one way you could do it is you could have reduced thought to consciousness, and then you reduce consciousness to something like neural states. Mm. But I was thinking then you have something like either a super genius thesis or a type identity thesis between phenomenal states and neural states. Yeah. But then I don't think that you'll be able to remain neutral on the wide content issue because those right will be internally like determined. Yeah. Yeah. So I was just thinking, and I'm thinking the standard way of arguing that naturalism is compatible with uh, phenomenal theories of intentionality is to embrace a radical internalism. Yeah. Where, that's how I read Mendel, Levici, and Forget, at least. So right, just yeah, good. That, I mean, I don't care, like, you know, maybe these, maybe externalism was kind of like something that in the 80s we really wanted, <laughs> now it's like up for grabs again. So yeah. I, I just think you should be upfront about okay. that. Okay. Yeah. yeah, that's helpful. Yeah, I mean, there's, um, uh, Cotty Farkas is another one of these people who, uh, I think she has a paper phenomenal intentionality without compromise. And so, uh, um, interesting. So you think, just just go whole hog. <laughs> well, I mean, I at least think you should just, I see. this reply might lead you to, what might lead to a commitment on the wide content, narrow content issue, even though yeah. you were suggesting earlier in the talk you want to remain. Would be neutral, I see, I see. So maybe yeah. I might have to put some cards on the table there. Yeah, at that stage, of the yeah, dialectic. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, nice. I see. Is it is that is that reply? I guess is, is, am I in that situation uh, in virtue of the 
identity th story you told? Or? The, uh, reply to the second objection relies on you rejecting like the motivations for it. Right. I mean, one motivation yeah. for um, is to get a naturalistic theory of. You seem to be suggesting, well, why would you even want this second kind of view? Yeah. And then you were saying, well, we want to be maybe naturalistic. We might want to be natural. Right. I see. I see. So maybe. I mean, it's unclear whether that's kind of um, not the central move. Right. Dialectic at yeah. that point. So one thing you could do is maybe you just want to get rid of that. Um, yeah, good. And then object. And then just because it's too committal. Right. Or something like that. Yeah, it's just a suggestion. No, that's, that's really helpful. Thanks a lot. I appreciate it. Sorry. Oh, uh, yeah, in the back. Yeah, yeah so um, <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of thinking that let's say <laughs> you might want to have a subpersonal theory of language processing yeah. in which your grammar has content, mm. uh, but where the constructs of that grammar don't surface yeah. in the contents of the file. So it seems like your response to the unconscious objection is going to bleed out into these other yeah, phenomena. Trouble, let's say. I and, see. Um, um, yeah, well, just like that some things are a verb phrase. Mm -hmm. right. um, I see. So there's some, what, sin let me know if I'm engaging. There's like some uh, syntactic content below. Some personally, and that's sort of necessarily below the surface of consciousness, and so there we have some like content that's not determined phenomenally. Um, it seems like you might have some trouble. I mean, like I don't know exactly. Like, it's, yeah. like, it's a, it, there's a lot of moving parts about what it means for um, the content of a you know, disposition to be determined by. Yeah, good. You might think there's a weird like, story. Yeah. Know, like, you know, sort of most linguists think that they're discovering features of mental grammar that mm -hmm. most native speakers are unaware of consciously. Yeah, nice. And so, counterexample. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, these are algorithms that your mind is executing. It's like old instructions. Or representation of, mm -hmm. but that you don't know about and you don't have any phenomenal experience of. I see. But that there's something phenomenal downstream of that. I see. And can okay. And do, th do we think that uh, they're so the kind of like derivative story that I was telling we think is I guess un un unnecessary, like it has sort of an internal content, like that's that can be sort of individuated without appeal to consciousness? I actually was Help. going to ask, now that we're on this topic, I yeah. was going to ask if you could say more about what you have in mind for the derivation that's underlying the story of the relationship. Mm. Um, is it necessary that a conscious thought was had at some time such that you have this standing state yeah. that you can then refer back to in these various processes? Yeah. If not, then I don't know that I'm understanding derivative in the same way as you are. Yeah. So if you could just say a little bit more about what you have in mind, that might I don't know, counterfactually maybe? Like, you know, does it make sense to credit me with the thought that Turkey or that Ankara is the is Ankara, Ankara is the capital of Turkey? Uh, <laughs> um, if I never like had it, maybe I as long as I'm disposed to have it, uh, um, then that's sufficient for crediting me with the, the thought. But what's getting the content there is the fact that I, I would, I suppose, have the the conscious thought, the conscious judgment. Um, I don't know, I feel like Joseph, I'm going to put Joseph on the spot here, because we've talked about this in the office, like with certain math problems, like do you believe that whatever plus whatever is something else? Right. Did you have the belief prior to the computation, were you disposed to come to that conclusion, where you never thought about it before? Mm -hmm. I don't have the answer to this, I'm mm -hmm. just really curious about the timing that you have in mind, and the, I guess the parts that we're playing with here, that we're holding in relation to one another. Yeah. Yeah, good. I see. So yeah, I'm trying to tell a story about it has content, but it's derivative 
from, this is helpful, because I haven't, this helped me think, this is basically helping me say I need to think through this more. Um, I, don't know if I, I don't know that I have anything to say right now, uh, but it's helpful. I need to think through, think through these issues more. Yeah. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, actually, it's sort of in the same vein. Okay, yeah. I think I want to kind of also push a little bit on one of the responses you made, where you were entertaining the idea that it would just be something like access consciousness that would be yeah. sufficient. Yeah, that's I right. Think, I think some of the issues that are coming up are reasons to take another look at that. OK, good. Because that's all. One thing you might think about things like representations of a syntactic structure and the yeah, derivation that goes into it is they're really sort of they're subversal in a way that would be quickly glossed as access mechanisms, monitoring mechanisms just don't cover them. Yeah. And that feels like, though, it's not a terribly deep, like, you know, evolutionary story. At least mm -hmm. it kind of seems extensionally pretty accurate. Yeah, good. And I'm also worried about cases that might be somewhere stuck in between. I'm not mm. sure how good these examples are. Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. Once you start looking for things we're representing, we're doing all kinds of stuff. Yeah. So in principle, at the moment, I'm, and the problem is every time I come up with one of these, all of a sudden it comes to consciousness. Right, yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. but yeah. notice that I was previously representing the brightness of the room, yeah. roughly the number of chairs around, right. and God knows how much else. Yeah. And a lot of that stuff would affect my behavior Yeah. without yeah. it being anything that feels like I would have been happy attributing any phenomenology yeah. to it Good. until such time as I drag it up. To yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, and so that makes me really wonder if what's kind of one of the things that's really important is just whether and putting that spotlight on it. Yeah, good. Which would be naturally quickly glossed as mere access consciousness, and then the right. challenge would be, and why do I need more? Yeah, nice. Um, I see. I see. That's helpful. So maybe that's. Uh, Maybe there are myriad things like that. that that's, yeah, uh, I think it just, that, there's, there's, yeah. once you have representations, you've got a lot of them. Yeah, good, good. Um, it may be like that what I should do is just to limit the scope. And so there may be like certain things about conscious thoughts that I want to sort of carve, a, sort of carve out as playing a kind of, um, I think, important epistemic role for uh, for like human subjects, and so maybe I can like, uh, I don't know, allow for these non-conscious intentional properties. I don't know if that's to give up the game or not, um, um, but while maintaining that they don't have like the sort of special good-making features that I, I want to attribute to, to conscious thoughts. Um, Let me give you one more yeah. example that might be relevant. Totally. Because it, it's sort of epistemically and kind of behaviorally relevant. Mm -hmm. So you're driving. Yeah, yeah. And something somehow affects your visual field, and you feel this great temptation to turn, uh -huh. partly because in some way or another you've represented something as coming at you at a particular angle, at a particular velocity. Mm -hmm. And often this is so subpersonal yeah. that you're not really tracking any of that, but it's still feeling like it's immediately affecting your behavior in a way that's sort of epistemically up for grabs, because often you need to correct yourself as, no, don't do that, you're going to cause an accident. I see. Getting is a, you know something happened that because of the way you're tracking turned out like bad information. Mm, I see, I see. And so the idea is because it's affecting our behavior like so like noticeably, readily, or it, it's it's affecting our behavior and that we can put it into the scope of like good and bad reasons. Oh, and I see, I but see. But yet it doesn't at the I see. at the time of occurrence. It That's interesting. Seem to come with anything that looks like. A, Quality. In fact, I wasn't even clear yeah. that there was a bear there until I went back and figured out why I felt the urge to turn. Yeah, okay, interesting. I guess I would want to I would want to push back on maybe the supplying a reason <laughs> aspect. Uh, yeah. But but uh, that's a good case for me to think about it. That's that's super helpful. Because that, that, that does maybe encroach on the the good making features of the, the conscious uh, uh, grounded yeah. content that I'm trying to put halos around. So yeah, th thanks for the comment. I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, yeah, it, or Jean-Paul, yeah. I'm, I'm, just, I'm gonna go back to your initial example that was supposed to help us think about 
what part of the felony it was. Yeah. So it's a string of words that's structurally ambiguous. Mm -hmm. um, and one way of describing those cases is you've got a string of phonemes that's susceptible of two distinct analyses. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if, this is an if, if you think there's a parsing module, mm -hmm. then why is that kind of case not actually pretty much like the sensation case? Oh. Right, because like this, that was supposed, this was supposed to be the case that helps us distinguish yeah. the sensey cases from the cognitive cases. Right. But like, at least when I teach um, uh, ambiguity, like one of the things I'd actually reach for, you know, for it's in many ways like necrocute uh, ambiguity. Mm -hmm. Right, you, you've got a, right. a stimulus that actually isn't three-dimensional at all. Right. But there's two ways of perceiving it. Yeah. And you can feel the difference. Yeah. Likewise, the string of phonemes doesn't have the string, the string of phonemes doesn't have either objective analysis. Right. You're just imposing two ah, analyses on it, and you can feel the difference. Now, I agree. We yeah. we, we we do draw a distinction between the senses and the language faculty. Yeah. But if you think there's a parsing module, like is that really is that really where you want to go for making? Here's the here's the nice clean. It's sensey over there. Yeah. It's good. Here. Yeah, nice. It may be that the lit, like calls like non sentry that the, that's just like not helpful, or maybe it's like very obscure. Like what the distinction between non sentry and sentry comes to. Um, maybe all I need is that it, it, it does play this play this content determining role, and is it sentry? Is it not? Um, I don't know. Maybe. But yeah. part of the reason why you hear me say a little more about this is that yeah. if in fact. Um, You've got this phenomenon of talking to ourselves, yeah. uh, and there's a fair amount of evidence that um, uh, when you're doing that, phonological representations are getting activated. Mm -hmm. Now, like you wonder, like how much of the, uh, you know, whether it's Rob Wilson trying to like you know find a thought or whatever, <laughs> uh, 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 like how much of what's getting called consciousness is doing yeah, there's an overlay of phonological. Representation, but but it, but all of that really is is not so far removed from perception and the mm -hmm. kind of consciousness that attaches to perception, mm -hmm. right? Then, like, I'm just wondering, um, where where do we go to get nice, clean examples that will help help me feel understand <laughs> what cognitive phenomenology is? Yeah. It's not going to be susceptible, to, but that's just phonology in disguise. I see, I see. Interesting. I mean, people try and do different things. So, like garden path sentences. Um, uh, like, well, I don't have an example of a garden path sentence, but. Uh, yeah, good. Uh, yeah, good. Uh, <laughs> yeah, good. Uh, good. I'm talking about something. Um, yeah, the difference between. First, you don't get a joke, and then you do understand a joke. So there's a kind of understanding experience or aha moment that comes once once you get it. Um, Galen Strawson has the well, actually. So now that I, 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 I let me know if this example is susceptible to the kind of things you're, you're worried about. Hearing a, uh, uh, I guess a, a, a polyglot, uh, someone who speaks French and English, listening to the radio in, in, in French. Right. No, no, right now it's like repeatedly they listen. Yeah. So if one was going to take now one more step okay. and say, as for phonology, so for linguistic meaning, mm. um, now, uh, right, like now, like where do I go to find, um, honest to God, cognitive phenomenology mm -hmm. that doesn't, so to speak, have the taint of linguistic meaning or linguistic phonology sort of process? I see. Um, yeah, good. I mean, it's a good question. Like, uh, you know, the extent to which um, people, I guess, is, is that? I guess, as I'm wondering, is that is that meant to? Sorry, I'm not, I'm not sure what exactly to say right here. Um, yeah, yeah. So, and you brought up the example of incantation. Yeah, so good. That's now we're in, yeah, now that we're in language land, there are people with the tickets and reports that have no blah blah, right? So there is no phonological overlay. 
to the extent there are people who certainly have thoughts but don't have any of the nice sensory bells and whistles that mm -hmm. go along with the thoughts, and it seems like that might be a decent place to start to pull these things apart. Yeah, nice. Right. So people report not having any visual uh, or auditory, broadly construed to include inner speech. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. On that note, when you were talking through that example where he was looking for the thought, people were nodding, and I was like, I don't understand what is happening. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Yeah, so um, it may be that we just vary a lot in our, our, our mental imagery. Um, and so, um, Maybe, so maybe, yeah, maybe aphantasics are, are a cleaner case of honest to God. <laughs> um, but I guess what, what I want to say was um, uh, maybe, I, I guess the, the, it's good to talk to linguists about this because um, uh, you know, what people call a conceptual phenomenology or, or understanding experiences. Um, um, I guess I, I, I should think more about how distinctions and linguistics come to bear on these things. Yeah, for that, thank, thanks for the question. Hey, I just wanted to follow up on uh, Matthew's question. So one thing you could always say is that uh, doing derivations um, in your subpersonal states is not the same kind of mental state as having a thought, if it's even a mental state at all. I mm -hmm. mean, there is something very different about those explanations of behavior than the kinds of explanations you get of behavior you get when it's like uh, the kinds of thoughts that you seem to have in mind during your talk. So mm -hmm. I just don't see, I mean, you might have a problem with the kinds of cases Michael's having, like he's like, well, they're kind of so personal, kind of personal, we can't really tell, but right. you could always, um, if you have a view like this, it seems like a natural move to just say that we're talking about different things. Yeah, so sort of just be, be stipulative. Yeah, about. I mean, Unless you want, unless they, and then, you know, it's almost like the burden is on them. Like, there are a lot of cases like this in cognitive science, too. Like, when I reach for my coffee cup, I'm like taking the retinal information and coordinating with like, the proprioceptive information and then subtracting. I mean, <laughs> right. That's what the models say in cognitive science, but am I doing it? Is right. It? Yeah. Good. I see. Yeah. I see. So be, be more steadfast, maybe, in, yeah. in, in response to those cases. Yeah. yeah, good. That's helpful. Oh, yeah. Say that people were behaving as acting as if yeah. they had pains. Yeah. Because I actually think there's a different case that comes closer to that, and I want to hear more about how different they are. Oh, okay. Really, what I'm thinking about is the, the, the very old days Putnam Spartans case. Oh, I see. And there it actually really fits that description very nicely, right? So the thing is, they feel pain. Yeah. It's just that you expand the functional description a little bit, mm -hmm. and there are other things about the larger table that involve inhibiting the responses. I see. And that sort of naturally fits the description as if, right? As if I don't right. feel pain. Right? Yeah. So and I feel it, and other things being equal, I would exhibit avoidance behavior, and my physiology is affected. It's just that because I'm smart and I have to not show it. Um, mm -hmm. That's as if. And what I was worried about is that what you were going after doesn't need that description. So as I said, that thing is a minor question, but mm -hmm. I was sort of worried about how you really wanted to describe your case. Yeah, I see. So, so sorry, I, I want to make sure I'm understanding the, the point. Are you saying that like you build all of that into the, the functional role of the... Yeah, of the, and so the, the natural way to go at that didn't seem to quite be... If, if my description, the sort of Putnam-inspired description, is, mm -hmm. is the right way to capture the, what's happening when people act as if they're in pain, or act as if they're not in pain. Yeah, case, right? oh, I see. Then I'm not sure I'm getting from your gloss on it what you wanted from the case. I, I see. Want to more about how you really want the case to go. Interesting, yeah. So I guess this is, this is a more... Uh, uh, 
Sorry, I guess it, it, sorry, it's the, maybe I'm not understanding. It's, it's the as if. Uh, the, Can you go back to that slide? Yeah, yeah let's do it. Let's, maybe I'm just, I, it might be that I just kind of didn't. No, no, I don't think you are. I was feeling distracted by wanting to describe it differently. Do, 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 do. Ah. Right, in that case, it seems right to say that the madman feels pain but acts as if he doesn't. That's what I'm worried about. Uh -huh. If the act is if he doesn't, it's to me not like a madman, but like a Spartan. But oh, I see. Actually, I, I was wondering about this case, too. Uh -huh. Because it sounds like, you know, once you, so I, think, I was also thinking about functional profile stuff. You know, what counts as a functional profile? Mm, yeah. I, don't wanna, I don't want to be a behaviorist and say, oh, it's just behavioral tendencies, because that's clearly not true because the Spartan case. Um, and in the madman's case, like, how much of this can you strip away or change before I don't want to call this pain anymore? Yeah. And yeah. if you say, oh, you know, he's, his body has nerves, but they don't, like, protect damage, and also he um, doesn't respond as though he's protecting damage, and that's not pain. Mm -hmm. Neither part of it has any of the functional characteristics that pain has. And even if you say, like, oh, but it feels, he feels the way we feel. Yeah. Well, why, well, for one reason, one thing, I, I just don't think I can't know that. But even if it's, like, Word of God, mm -hmm. I, I still don't want to call that pain because it doesn't do anything that pain does. I see. So maybe there's just like a yeah. a point about the semantics of pain that like. Yeah, I'm like, well, then what is that? I say pain. <laughs> <laughs> but he's like eating an ice cream cone. He's he's acting yeah. as though he enjoys it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The computations internally are as though he enjoys. Yeah, yeah. And also, it's caused by things that everyone enjoys. <laughs> he say he enjoys it. Yeah, yeah good. It feels bad, but I'm doing good, good things as though I enjoy it. I'm like, what does that even mean? Yeah, I mean, maybe one thing to say is to like not confuse the metaphysics with the epistemology in this case. Um, that like there are just certain things that certain states that you can only know first personally, or you. you can know in a certain way first personally. But isn't it begging the question to say like just there is just such a thing that that is what it feels like to have pain. It just is. And that is what pain is. Mm. I'm saying like, no, even if you had that feeling, that's not what pain is. Pain isn't the feeling of that thing. It's all the other it's the whole computational process. So even if you had that thing but totally separated from all the other parts of the computation, I don't want to call that pain. Mm. Interesting. It's not exactly it's not caused by the opposite of pain, it doesn't like, cause the opposite behaviors to pain, for example. You know, some of the time. And you're a part of God saying, yeah. and they feel the same way you yeah. feel. Yeah, I don't know, right? It's like, that's more of a spark because, yeah, right? they're not like, ooh, I'm in pain, better go to my screen. Yeah, it's like, I'm in pain. Yeah, sorry, I, 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 we stop about this. <laughs> yeah, no, thanks. So just, yeah. just, just follow up on this, like, yeah. in favor of never confusing this cause with negative. Yeah. And vice versa. Ned's condition as stated was you show him a state. Uh, if you deny these states to yeah. things that actually happen, at last yeah. check there were no Martians. I see, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this whole, this whole, like, David, this whole David Lewis <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Like, what about peace office? What I can imagine, like, yeah, strains my theories about nature. I say, well, yeah. Why don't I just say, done, gone. <laughs> But, but, but this is important here, right? Because, because the Spartans are real. Yeah, right? good. Okay, so good. That, so, so, good, yeah, so, thanks. So, or at least that's that's so I, I didn't mean to, I, I didn't mean to uh, not respond, sorry. No, no, that's fine. It, it, it was a messy question. But yeah, I mean, the Spartans are real, or at least limits of things that are very real. Yeah. I, mean, I see. People, everybody's had the experience of eating something you actually find disgusting, but trying right. to make it look like you like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fired. I see. I think the extreme case would be like people with locked in syndrome who have no behavioral tendencies whatsoever because they cannot behave, but they, um, we assume that they experience things. When they wake up, they say, yeah, I'm probably. Good. Okay, so yeah. this is helpful. I'll, I'll uh, add a character to my, uh, <laughs> the dialectic of this section and think more about what to say. No, th thanks for that. I appreciate it. And, yeah. Preston, I have. Other think more about that. Yeah, yeah. Thing, but we were, we were talking about the research into um, unconscious processing. Yeah. And Joseph just was doing this. how I do this research. <laughs> and then hearing the methods of the guy, I guess I, maybe I don't either. I'm not familiar <laughs> with it. But hear, just hearing it described, I thought, 
Okay, is there another, is there an alternative explanation for why people um, Yeah, yeah. Processing people are aware of? Yeah, good. Would it be like an interference effect? Two explanations. What does it mean, before we get the explanations, can you tell me what it means to do better? Yeah, yeah, good, yeah, yeah. That was, they, the, uh, like, independently of the, uh, of the, like, study, they, like, judge uh, independently of that uh, aspect. Uh, uh, that part of the tr of the, the trial, they judged which roommate would actually which one they would prefer or something. Uh, oh, so a participant. A participant, yeah. So they, they did the experiment and then after the fact they're like, oh, actually. I forget the yeah I think it would be after yeah. Okay. yeah. Sorry, I, the details I'm I'm, I'm I'm having trouble recalling, but but yeah. <laughs> so, so I can't, I mean, to a certain term, I think I'm not just not really enough to be. Uh, the point isn't to demonstrate unconscious thought, it's to say that it's superior. Um, a, lot, a lot of that work is put on the replication process. Oh, I see. There was a meta analysis done by you in London. Um, uh, Dijkstra House himself came out and said not to trust anything before 2010 because he admitted the question of research practices. Oh, so, wow. I, I don't think we need to appeal to that theory. Um, I mean, it's, it's not novel or famous. Uh, some of you might have been able to do that. Uh, my, my big risk for you would be Nick Cheever. The mind is flat. Ah. So, um, the mind is just a conscious cause. Uh, that would be true. I'd uh, just be careful about that. Interesting. OK. Yeah, we should definitely talk more, <laughs> more about this. This is helpful for me. Uh, cool. OK. Anything else? Thanks so much. Yeah.